which was Hassel. So the difference between, well, one of the many differences between the neoclassical vision of capitalism and the vision that post-Keynesians and several other schools of thought have about economics is about its stability. The essential uh, vision of capitalism that neoclassicals have, it's fundamentally an equilibrium system. And if it's not an equilibrium, it's been disturbed by an exogenous shock and, uh, and it's a question of waiting until the shock goes, goes away until the system returns to its normal behaviour beforehand. That's the basic attitude they have. Now, the, 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 the key view that I have been working on, of course, my whole career as an academic, is Minsky's alternative. And, oh, great, she's seeing the wrong screen there. Hang on a second. I'll see. Actually, there we go again. Let's go back and I'll try that once more. Sorry about that. OK, display settings. Duplicate slideshow. Right. There we go. That. Okay. So Minsky said his alternative view to this vision, this is writing back in the 1980s, uh, which he called unreconstructed Keynesian, is that capitalism is inherently flawed, being prone to booms, crises and depressions. He said this instability is due to characteristics the financial system must possess if it is to be consistent with full-blown capitalism. In other words, it's not an option. It's not something you can reform away. And he said the reason this, this will have this characteristic is that such a financial system will be capable of both generating signals that induce an accelerating desire to invest and of the financing that accelerating investment. Now, what I've really been doing, for my, again, for my whole career is trying to find a way of expressing that in a mathematical model. And I've recently, I think, completed that. Uh, well, there's always more to be done, but I've got to the stage where I think I've got an essential expression of why Minsky was right that it's something fundamental, otherwise something you cannot reform away. And these uh, elements come out of taking the Minsky model that I wrote back in the 92 and published in 95, uh, in other words, before the Great Moderation became part of the lingo of uh, the American neoclassical establishment, even though if we look back at it, we can probably date that so-called phenomenon from 1980. It was before it had a name and before it was recognised as a pattern. So that's a very important thing to, to point out, which I'll, I'll show you is the, how simply this model generates those results in a moment. But I realise that model can be expressed in three simple identities. And they're things which, you, as identities, they're not equations. Equations are things where you say, I propose this model of this particular concept fitting this particular set of data. This is saying, take a set of definitions and expand them and put them in dynamic form, and you get this result. So the first identity is the employment rate will rise if economic growth exceeds the sum of population growth and growth in labour productivity. Now, if you work out what employment is, you know, the ratio of the number of people of the job to uh, population, then you take a look at population growth and labour productivity, that's a fact. That is simply a, expressing a, a statistical identity in a dynamic form. The second one is to say the wage share of output will rise if money wage demands exceed the sum of inflation and growth in labour productivity. That again is an identity. Okay. The third one is that the, private, the ratio of private debt to GDP will rise if the rate of growth of private debt exceeds the sum of inflation and the rate of economic growth. Now that's again an empirical statement. Okay. There's no, you simply can't disagree with those. All you can do, and this is what the neoclassicals, when you look at them, have actually done for their history, is deny the importance of the third identity. Okay. What they've been saying throughout, pardon me, my translator is telling me to slow down. Uh, what, what neoclassicals have done for their history is deny the importance of that third identity. The whole idea of uh, loanable funds is that the level of debt doesn't matter for macroeconomics. The whole idea of conventional finance is that um, you can separate completely economics from finance. Okay? So they basically say there's no role for private debt in capitalism. Now, a huge part of what the whole post-Keynesian movement that I've been part of has been emphasising is the importance of endogenous money and therefore the creation of money by the creation of debt by the private banking system and the macroeconomics of that, which has been my major focus. So those three identities simply can't be, can't be argued with. You can simply... All you can do is reject the importance of the third one or you can argue there are more identities that should be added. The one obvious one that I haven't added there is the government sector. I did that in the 95 paper. I can bring that in again and then I get a more elaborate set of statements. But again, 
a factual statement. That particular, the government relationship I had said the uh, government spending or government uh, injections of money into the economy will rise if the government spending rises faster than GDP. That's also a simple identity. But I'm just going to be looking at a, a private capitalist system now and saying what would happen if you take these identities and you express them in the simplest possible model, what happens to that capitalist economy? Now, the simplest possible model is to say that investment is determined by the rate of profit. So I simply have capitalists investing depending upon the rate of profit they're earning. And debt is brought in by saying that firms borrow money to invest when their desired level of investment exceeds their, their profits. So if they want to invest more than they've earned in profits in that particular uh, instant in time, they borrow money from the banks. So the rate of change of debt is investment minus profits. Very simple relationship. That has absolutely no element of household borrowing to it, and it also has borrowing solely to add to productive capacity. So there's no Ponzi finance in the classic sense of the word in this model. It's simply saying capitalists, if they wish to invest and create more productive capacity than they have the retained earnings to do, they will borrow money to finance that. And very simple fixed capital output ratio. So I effectively have capital employed at 100%, which means, of course, that's unrealistic. But I brought, if I brought in the realism that capital was, was employed less than 100%, it would make my results stronger, not weaker. So I'm doing, in some ways, the best possible case. And for workers, I have a simple linear Phillips curve where the reactions of workers to the level of employment is a simple linear function. Now, Bill Phillips, when he first wrote that, uh, the, that paper and the precursors to it, argued that the relationship would be highly nonlinear. But I'm making the simplest possible case to see what happens. Now what you get, and this was again by working just with those identities, is a remarkable pattern on income distribution. And that is the profit share cycles around an equilibrium, which is determined by the system parameters. So whatever capital output ratio I use, whatever uh, rate labour productivity rate of growth, population rate of growth, depreciation rate, etc., etc., they determine an equilibrium rate and the profit rate will cycle around that equilibrium. Wages share, on the other hand, is a residual. The wages share of output is the level of output minus profits minus debt service. And again, with a very simple model where I have a fixed rate of interest, that debt service, well, the, the level of the debt service boils down to the debt to GDP ratio. So what this concludes is, which is again remarkable because this was not something I forced into the model, it's a, it's a result of exploring its uh, internal structure, is that workers pay for the higher level of debt. Even though workers and the people that are doing the borrowing this model are the capitalists, who are the ones earning profit, the social group that pays for the higher level of debt are the workers. They get a lower share of wages as debt rises, and it's a direct causal relationship. So you get a direct negative relationship between the debt ratio and the wages share of output. So they pay for a high level of debt, even they don't they, they don't borrow at all. And you can imagine the class implications and political implications of this. And I'll finish up and talking about that in a moment. Now, when, you, when I simulate the model, it results in a system that has two feasible outcomes. The first is a convergence to equilibrium, you know, that wonderful place neoclassicals believe we're always in. Um, so you have an equilibrium debt ratio, an equilibrium employment rate, and an equilibrium wages share of output, and that is one possible outcome of the model. The other possible outcome is an apparent great moderation followed by a crisis which leads up to having infinite de debt compared to GDP, zero employment and zero wage share of output. Now again that's unrealistic for the simple reason that I'm not including the possibility of bankruptcy. What I'm going to argue is we have to have bankruptcy on steroids to avoid capitalism turning up in crises all the time. So I'm looking at the situation where we simply have the sort of world that 
um, Wolfgang Schäuble thinks is marvellous, where you simply have to repay your debts, even if you can't repay them. So the stable convergence case looks like this, and I'll simulate that for you over here in Minsky. Notice I'm changing one of the parameters here. I'm making the model linear. I'm leaving out prices, but I've got debt in the system. And if I simulate this, I'll speed it up a bit. You get a set of cycles. I'm, here I'm plotting wages share on the vertical axis and the employment rate on the horizontal. You can see they appear to be heading in towards an equilibrium level. You can see the cycles in employment are getting smaller and so are the cycles in wages share of output and profit. Make it a bit faster again. And you finally reach that nirvana of equilibrium where employment remains at the same ratio, employment ratio remains the same, profit share is constant, wages share is constant, etc., etc. And you can see the shape of the, the debt this is debt, the debt ratio rises, but it reaches an equilibrium level too. So that's, that's the world the neoclassicals, well, they'd like us to live in. They don't even know that we live in a world with, uh, where debt matters, but that's their world. So that's, that's the, um, the good situation. This is the bad one. Notice what's happened there. That apparent convergence becomes a breakdown. So you have a period where... I'm trying to get some simulation elements to turn up there, and I've got them the wrong way around, pardon me. I'll show it here by changing one parameter. What I'm changing here is how much capitalists react to a gap between the level of profit at which they don't want to borrow money and the level at which they do. So making them more willing to borrow money when the profit rate exceeds their expectations is the only change I've made in the model. Nothing else is altered. Now I simulate it, and you get the same apparent pattern initially. You can see there's obviously a difference when I do the phase plot over here, but the cycles in employment are getting smaller. Looks like a great moderation is taking place. Look what's happening to the wage or share of output. That's declining in a cyclical pattern. Now notice what's starting to happen. Those cycles in employment, which were getting smaller, suddenly start to get bigger. So rather than reaching the equilibrium, you've gone past it. Okay, it's unstable. And if you keep on going, you have higher and higher cycles, rising level of private debt, booms and busts, okay, both booms and busts in this model. Keep it going for long enough, and you get a complete breakdown. But the level, level of debt finally overwhelms the economy. Profit collapses to zero, or negative infinity. You can see it's going negative here. There's the line where profit is negative. And ultimately, the whole thing explodes. Now, that's with absolutely simple linear relationships, which, of course, don't describe reality. But I'm getting nonlinear dynamics there. The, re the reason I emphasise this point is nonlinear dynamics in any system come out of the, into the structure of the system. They don't, they're not imposed by behavioural relationships. They're part of the structure of the economy. And the nonlinearity that dominates there, uh, the two, there are two. The main one is that wages are equal to the level of employment time the times the wage rate when there are both variables. And the other nonlinearity is the compounding of debt. You pay interest on debt. Now, the only difference between those two cases is this parameter here. That's the how aggressive capitalists are to a difference between the profit rate they get and the profit rate they're happy with. And the more they're willing to invest, the bigger the, bigger the boom you get. Now, if I include prices in the system, so I say we actually have a system with prices and we have nonlinear relationships rather than linear. So I have a nonlinear relationship of capitalists to the rate of profit for their investment and a nonlinear relationship for what workers to the level of employment for their wage demands. And both these make sense. In, in the capitalist case, if you have a linear relationship between in, uh, level of profit and the, and the level of investment, you argue that at a certain level of profit, capitalists go about smashing up factories. Okay? They go and destroy capital. So the nonlinearity says, no, they don't do that. 
They simply don't invest. So I put that, that behaviour in the model and now what you see, I'll slow the simulation down a bit, what you see coming out of that is much more like the pattern we actually observed in the real world. Cycles getting smaller, so any neoclassical looking at this thinks employment is uh, heading towards equilibrium. Inflation reducing, so they think they're getting the great moderation. And then inflation becomes deflation. Employment collapses. And the economy collapses as well in the absence of a government rescue. So the same apparent pattern, but a far, far more realistic. But the actual basic dynamics come out of the structure, not out of putting those nonlinear assumptions in there. They simply give me a more realistic picture of how capitalism behaves. So what you've got there is an incredibly simple, structurally derived model of capitalism. And it captures the stylized facts of the last 40 years. Great moderation followed by a crisis, exploding private debt and rising inequality. They're all there in an incredibly simple model. And the implication from that model is that if you don't write debt off, capitalism will collapse into a black hole of debt, which is what we're seeing happening in Europe, what we would have seen in America had it not been for the scale of the government rescues, etc., etc. So insisting that all debts must be honoured is a recipe for a total collapse of capitalism. And yet that's what is being insisted upon by politicians like Schäuble and by economists and people who have got a moralistic attitude towards people in debt saying debtors must repay, etc., etc. They're actually setting us up for a permanent collapse. Even when I leave out Ponzi lending, okay, even when I leave out household borrowing, you get this result. Now, that means that the true politics of helping society survive, and that by this I mean capitalist society survive, is you have to have debt write-offs. Unless debt is eliminated on a regular basis, that is the fate we have for capitalism. We could find ourselves in the stable case, but all you have to do is look at history to know that's not what capitalists do. In the 1920s, boom and bust, was a period of euphoric expectations. What we've been through up in 2007 was another period of euphoric expectations. Again, Minsky's insight about the fundamental instability of capitalism is correct. So the politics, what would be needed to make capitalism sustainable as a society, you have to have debt write-offs. Now that means a complete inversion in the power relationships in capitalism right now because fundamentally the financial class dominates the political class. Everything that's being done under the cover of neoclassical economics most of the time, everything that's being done is about enforcing the rights of the creditor. Debts must be repaid, etc., etc. But with endogenous money, we, we know that not only is debt not what created not in the way that neoclassicals think, not by patient people lending to impatient, but it's created by double entry bookkeeping. We also know that it's actually easy, in that sense, to change the level of debt in society. Um, and writing off debt doesn't mean that somebody who's worked hard is being robbed. Okay? Because, again, the vision we have of lending coming out of the loanable funds mentality of neoclassical economics and out of our own personal experience in lending to each other is that if somebody borrows money from you and doesn't repay you, you've worked to save that money and they've effectively robbed you. And so your attitude to somebody who doesn't repay money they've borrowed from you is negative, okay? unless you've got some personal relationship that makes you think it's a decent thing to do. But when banks create money and create debt, nobody had to work hard to save the money. The banks create the money by double-entry bookkeeping. I'll give you my favourite anecdote of this, which is actually a, a case in New Zealand about uh, five years ago now where a petrol station owner applied for an overdraft from his bank. It was actually an Australian bank. I think, I think it was the Westpac bank. Of 100,000 Australian dollars, or New Zealand dollars, 100,000 dollars. And the overdraft was approved. And the next day, the, the service station, of the petrol station owner checked his bank account. He had a $10 million overdraft limit. 
He took one look at the $10 million, made a $7 million withdrawal and hopped on the next plane to China. He got arrested and brought back in Australia, in New Zealand. He's now serving a jail sentence there. But somehow the bank created 100 times as much money as it meant to. How did it happen? Well, the simplest explanation of how that occurred is that bank keyboards have a double zero. So when the clerk was entering the loan, the clerk typed one zero 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 zero, forgot to press the decimal point and pressed double zero and by one less keystroke created 100 times as much money. Now there's no other phenomenon in the universe where you can create 100 times as much as an output by making 10% less input. Okay? One less keystroke created 100 times as much money. So that's how we have to think about bank debt. It's a double entry bookkeeping process. So if you see that way, look at money that way, debt write-off is easy. It's essentially bookkeeping. You make an entry on one side, you make a matching entry on the other, you abolish the debt. And as Devram explained yesterday, I think he might make some more comments today as well, this is what the Swedes did when they had their crisis back in the 1990s. They wrote off the debts, which bankrupted the banks, meant they had to be nationalised and reorganised, and finally they were sold back into private ownership at a profit to the state, ultimately. But of course, if you keep on doing that, the pattern's going to repeat itself. So the alternative that we're proposing is you can use the government's capacity to create money to inject money into private bank accounts, and you could do that on a per capita basis. Give everybody an equal amount of money. This was actually done uh, without the condition I'm about to suggest by the Australian government as one of its rescue policies when the global financial crisis first struck back in 2008. Every Australian who'd paid their tax that year got a $1,000 refund check from the Treasury. And that was a major reason why Australia was one of the two countries in the OECD not to record a recession during the global financial crisis. So it was simply a book ent bookkeeping entry in that sense. Now, if you do this, everybody, whether you're a saver or a debtor, gets that cash injection. And the condition I would add is that those who are in debt must pay their debt down. Now what that means is the savers don't lose out, the debtors get a cash injection, the banks don't lose out either because reserves replace the loans they had beforehand. But what they do have is drastically reduced liquidity because the debt is the income earning asset for them. The reserves don't earn income. So if you do this and drastically reduce debt levels in society, Banks have an incentive to lend once more. Now, many, many other controls have to come in there, but that is a sustainable alternative that addresses that fundamental instability in capitalism. But to do it, we have to completely invert the current power relationships in capitalism. Because what we have now is not what uh, Eisenhower first titled the military-industrial complex dominating society. What we have now is the financial political complex. And the politicians can't imagine a world where the financial people aren't telling them what to do. Now instead to get a world where the politicians tell the financial people what to do and write their debts off and do something like this is a complete power inversion. It's not going to happen without something like what did happen in the 1930s if you look at what the West does in that situation. The West is completely impotent politically about the relationship between the political class and the financial class. The one place where something like this could be done is China. And I think China is about to have a serious crisis, as big as Japan's in the 1990s. But the political power in, Japan, in China is such that if the, if the political class there decides to write off the assets, income earning assets of the financial sector, they'll do it. They've got the political power to do it. I'm not saying they will, but you're more likely to see something like this happen as a way of addressing the crisis in China than you're ever going to see in the West where the political power of the financial class is virtually absolute. So that's the struggle we face in the West and uh, I'm pessimistic. Thank you.